in no more than a very short period of time, like about maybe three minutes tops, two or three minutes, can you each tell me how would you answer the question that is inherent in the title of this event? What is the state of the LGBTQ movement? What would you focus on? What would you highlight? What, are, what is the state of it? And I'll just start immediately to my left with Katie. Thanks, Roger. Nice to see everybody here. I'm a native San Franciscan, so I'm always happy to do events here and come back home. Um, with Outright Action International being focused on global LGBTIQ human rights, I'll be answering most of my questions with that lens, of course. And I guess the three words that come to mind for me about the last year are burgeoning, backlash, and balance, or shall I say lack of balance. Let me give you a couple of examples to explain what I mean by that. In terms of burgeoning, we see unprecedented growth and um, really thriving of new organizations, emerging organizations, and activists all over the world. And we see a lot of progress on a number of fronts, things like uh, even though there are still 68 countries where being LGBTIQ is criminalized, we saw three or four countries decriminalize uh, being LGBTIQ during this past year. Um, we also saw three new countries approve marriage equality over the past year. We saw the World Health Organization depathologize being transgender and remove being transgender and um, remove being transgender from their international classification of disease for the first time. And we also saw pride celebrations growing bigger and bigger um, in places like Ukraine and many other places all over the world. So that's the burgeoning. Unfortunately, we also have the backlash, which of course we're facing here. And here are some of the ways that that looks around the world. Uh, despite the fact that three new countries decriminalized being LGBTIQ, unfortunately Kenya, whose high court was considering a de decriminalization case, declined to decriminalize being LGBTIQ. There are only four countries in the world that ban conversion therapy, something we're, we're doing a major campaign to try to address. Um, we've seen a reintroduction of the idea of a kill the gays law in Uganda, which some of you may have heard about in the past couple of months, and a number of roundups in Uganda arresting more than 100 activists. We see places like Indonesia and Egypt that have pending legislation to criminalize same-sex relations. Um, and we see we've lost activists. We've lost important leaders and activists in Russia, in Haiti, and in other places. Balance, um, what I wanted to say there is that we, in, in a report that Outright did last year, we found that there are 30 countries in the world out of 193 where we cannot find any LGBTIQ organizations. Any activity that's happening is completely underground. Whereas, of course, in other places, there's a very vibrant sector in our movement. So we need to address that imbalance, the urgency that people fa feel and face in places where they, they are facing extreme persecution, discrimination, violence. I don't think it's something that can is sustainable. Um, so I see more, uh, more burgeoning and more backlash coming ahead. Thank you. Chris? Cool. Um, good evening. So I think this is maybe my third time on this this panel or something like okay. that. So um, I will say that that feels kind of unique and in that I feel like we're in an ongoing conversation, even though it's been a year. Uh, so so I'll just start with that. Um, though some of what I'm about to say, I believe I probably have said the last couple of years um, because they are just sadly uh, still true and still the reality. And so, you know, I mean, I'll just preface by saying we're, we're in this moment and have been in for some time, right, where trans people, we are more visible in popular culture than ever before. However, we also know that the majority of trans people in this country are still facing intense discrimination, harassment, and violence, um, particularly black and bra brown trans folks, particularly black and brown trans women. Um, you know, with four times the poverty rate, uh, we did a study in the South that showed that uh, nearly 60% of trans women have faced violence by strangers. Uh, to date this year, there have been 24 murders of transgender people in this country, of which all but two are black trans women. Um, so, so this is all the reality and has been for some time. And then we have been under this, the Trump administration for the last couple of years, and what we have experienced is a strategic, ongoing, and relentless attempt to roll back the few rights and protections that our communities have 
to decrease and deny services, and ultimately to eliminate the very existence and deny our humanity. And I'm going to get um, later into some of the more specifics of the types of federal and state policies that have happened and that we anticipate. Um, but just wanted to start with that frame of this moment of intense attack that our communities are facing, along with so many other communities in, in, these in this country, from migrants to communities of color to Muslims to people with disabilities to women, right? This is just a moment in which so many vulnerable communities are under immense attack. And for the trans community, it's happening in a climate and context and history in which our movements have been historically and to date incredibly under-resourced, right? So the statistic is 0.03%. 0.03, right? So we're not even talking like 1% of foundation funding goes to trans-led organizations. That said, though, when I think about the state of the movement and I think about trans and gender nonconforming folks, I, I believe that the trans movement, that we are actually stronger and more organized and coordinated than we have ever been before. With hundreds of trans-led organizations all across the country, many of them led by black and brown trans women, leading beautiful, brilliant, and inspiring strategies and work that even in this moment of attack, in fact, in, this, in the face of escalating attack on our lives and our communities, that the trans movement is stronger and more organized than ever before. And I not only supposed to keep this to two to three minutes, so I'm just going to give two examples of that. Um, so one is right here in the Bay Area, right? We have incredible, powerful, trans-led, black trans women-led organizations, many who are moving work nationally as well as here in the Bay Area, from the Transgender Intersex Justice Project, working particularly with black trans women, um, many who are formerly incarcerated, Ella Para Trans Latina out of the Mission, a API Equality Northern California, that's leading incredible API trans-led work, um, to the Compton's Cultural District, to St. James Infirmary. Like here in the Bay Area, there are incredibly strong trans -ed organizations, many led by black trans women. And then I'll just close by saying that what, what we've also seen is that trans leaders and trans organizations are organizing nationally and coordinating and coming together and generating strategy and vision in a way that we just haven't seen in the past. And so some of that work is that the Transgender Law Center, we've been working with about 25 to 30 trans leaders from all across the country, the majority of whom are trans women of color. We've been working together for over a year at this point to vision what it looks like if we were to create our own agenda. Right? What, we, what it looks like if we were to create our own vision for the world and the movement that we want to see with, with the concrete solutions that are needed for our communities to thrive. So in early 2020, we, you're getting a little preview, um, we will be publicly rolling out a national trans agenda that has concrete policy solutions, community-based strategies, and analysis that is led by and grounded in trans communities. And we'll be able to get back to some of that um, as well. So, Casey? Yeah, well, so thanks, Roger, and the whole Horizons team for the opportunity to be here. It's a real honor, and to you all for coming out in the rain, although I guess that's normal for San Francisco, so maybe it's not a big deal. Um, so, you know, I would say, I mean, look, we're, we're under siege. We've heard this twice now already. Um, and in the 20 years that I've been doing this work, I mean, we've definitely had ups and downs. We have worked under some hard administrations, but this is really, really intense, what we're going through right now. Um, and, you know, part of this moment that we're in, I think, is that we've, as a community on a number of policy issues have made a lot of really incredible gains that I think many people thought they wouldn't see in their lifetimes. And the familiarity work that we've done with our country around who we are as LGBTQ people, and particularly for the transgender community, has not kept pace with the policy gains we've made. And so the backlash is particularly intense 
and um, I mean, people who would otherwise be predisposed to support us are really vulnerable to a lot of the tactics that our opposition is using to try to roll back support for us. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, all of that said, I, you know, maybe I'll be like the Pollyannish uh, optimistic person tonight. I don't know, but um, I, I think there's a lot of cause for optimism in this moment, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, because Part of what we're suffering from right now in uh, you know states across the country and obviously under the federal administration is that the the, the hardcore opposition to our community are in power right now. And so they are running the ball forward as fast and as furious as they can. I think in part because they know that their time is running out. This isn't like 20 or 30 years ago when the majority of the country was with them. The majority of the country is not with them. The majority of the country is with us, um, but is vulnerable to some of the kinds of attacks that, that our opponents are cleverly using to try to roll back support. Um, also, I think there's cause for optimism because, you know, the reality is even though it's, it's hard to see because it's hard to keep up with in this news environment um, and it's hard to feel like it's on the scale that we need given the attacks that we're under, we are really winning in a lot of contexts. It doesn't always break through, but we are. We're winning in the courts. We're winning at the ballot box. Um, we're winning in state legislatures, even in defensive fights where we're successful in stopping bad things. That is a win um, in this climate. And a lot of times those wins are pretty significant because of the kinds of people that we've been able to get to come forward to stop those attacks against us. Un unusual allies for our community, like the business community, conservatives, et cetera, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Um, so I will just conclude by saying that, you know, we're heading into what is, in my mind, in 2020, a really pivotal year for us as a community. So we have been working for at least 50 years since Stonewall to try to pass nationwide non-discrimination protections. And that's, I will talk a lot through that lens tonight because that's what I work on. Um, but I think in, in some ways the fight for these protections isn't just about the policy. It's pretty symbolic too. It's a pretty basic basic fight for dignity and respect. And next year, the Supreme Court, Roger mentioned this, the Supreme Court will have the opportunity to um, weigh in on three non-discrimination cases, one impacting a transgender worker and two impacting um, two gay workers. And they'll have the opportunity to say whether or not it's legal under federal law to fire LGBTQ people just because of who we are. And I think in that moment where we know that a lot of Americans don't support that. We know that a lot of Americans, though, also think we're already protected and aren't so sure that discrimination actually happens. That case, win or lose, is going to really call this question for our country. And it's going to be very nationalized. It will be in the media everywhere. And we'll actually have a real opportunity to have a, a national dialogue as a country about where people stand on LGBTQ people and what they're willing to do to help advance this cause with us. And um, you know, there's a, there's a number of things that I, that I can talk about tonight that we're doing to get ready for that. Um, but I think one of the points that I want to get across in the opening is, you know, we went through a big ballot fight in Massachusetts last year. It was the first statewide vote uh, on transgender rights in our country's history. It was specifically on the most controversial aspects of non-discrimination protections for transgender people. And we won that vote six, by, by 68 to 32 percent. And I know it's Massachusetts and everybody thought it was very easy. It was not. Um, but I share that as part of this conversation, mostly to say, um, we weren't so sure that people would show up for that fight, and they did, and they showed up vigorously. We had people who had never participated in an election before in their lives get off the couch and canvass on this issue in 2018, when there were lots of other things to fight for as well. And that, to me, is um, a sign that as this issue becomes more live next year, and it really gets on people's radars, and people have to take a stand, I think that we, we, will, we will see, at least symbolically, a shift and a willingness to really push back um, against these marginal interests that just happen to be in power right now and really pushing back on us. So I feel like there is, is cause for optimism in this moment, despite how chaotic things are. Great. Cool. Thank you, Casey. Please, Vicki. Sure. <laughs> um, no clapping for me. <laughs> Yay for optimism. I'll do better next time. <laughs>
So my name is Vicki Galbecca, and just I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people maybe aren't as familiar with the Southern Border Communities Coalition um, because we sort of view our lens in the world as really about border communities. Um, so just a real quick background about who we are. We're actually a coalition um, of about of networks. I guess we're a network of networks from San Diego to Brownsville, Texas. We're more than 60 organizations. We came together in 2011 and actually myself and uh, my colleague, now my boss, um, Andrea Guerrero, founded this uh, coalition when we were both working at the ACLU. I was in ACLU of New Mexico, and she was in the ACLU of San Diego. And you know, the rebels that we were, we decided that we were going to found this coalition because we were tired of the border communities being thrown under the bus. And we really brought all of these organizations together to focus on uh, you know, fair and accountable uh, border enforcement policies, ensuring that people who live in border communities are treated with dignity and people who travel through border communities are treated with dignity. And also we wanted to preserve human life at the border. At the time, we were seeing a whole bunch of use of fourth deaths happening at the US-Mexico border, including uh, six cross-border shootings, of uh, three of whom were teenagers who were standing in Mexico when a border patrol agent shot across the border and killed them. And none of those agents have been held accountable to this date. Um, so when we talk about state of the movement and you live in a border community, it's really hard to be optimistic about what's happening. Now, we have seen for the last two and a half decades this and even longer, but particularly in the last two and a half decades, we've seen this increased militarization of our borders and the erosion of our civil and human rights as a consequence of, of this militarization. But in the last, what was it, three years, <laughs> it seems like these problems have become exponentially worse under this administration. Um, and we see it on both sides of the border. We see individuals being held in inhumane conditions of confinement. We see families and children being held in horrific conditions that you would think are, wouldn't, do not represent the values of this country. We see miles and miles of border wall that have been built, by the way, for a long time, but now they're just getting taller and worse, and they have concertina wire on it. We've seen active duty troops. We see National Guard. We see um, roving patrols and interior checkpoints that are far from the actual border, up to 100 air miles in, that pull people over. And we all know that racial profiling happens at those border patrol checkpoints. We also have seen, just in the last year and a half, six child deaths because of the, the failure to provide adequate and timely medical attention to children who were experiencing flu or something like that, and including uh, Jacqueline Carr, who her, the anniversary of her death is coming up, and Felipe Alonso Gomez, who also died on the day after Christmas last year, and we're preparing some actions around that. So, what we have seen is really a dehumanization and criminalization of migration, much in the same way our LGBT communities have been criminalized and dehumanized for, for, for decades in this country. Um, we've also seen in Mexico this, this backlogging of people who are coming here to seek asylum and traditional groups who are eligible for asylum like LGBT uh, communities who can and should be able to apply for asylum while they're waiting in the United States are being returned to Mexico where they're being exposed to violence and very few of the kind of community support that we have in the United States for the LGBT community. We see individuals held in, in long-term detention facilities. I mean, really, it's just a, it really is a nightmare. Uh, that we're experiencing along the border. And it's very intersectional that we're seeing. It affects not just immigrants, but border residents, the LGBT community. And it's getting to the point where we're just like, 
wondering, you know, in my mind, I kind of think that what's happening in the Oval House, I don't know if this is actually happening in the White House Oval Room, but I see them kind of, kind of going like this, going like, okay, let's do this. Oh, all right, well, let's, let's do an asylum ban. Well, let's do, a, we're not gonna let people apply for asylum unless they apply for asylum for, in the first country they travel through. And it doesn't matter if that country is like known for violence or crime or whatever, right? So we're just seeing like this hyper militarization, but also a hyper cruelty in our border region. Okay, I've said all of that, but at the end of all, I actually am optimistic that we could turn this around. <laughs> There's a saying in Spanish that says, no hay mal que por bien no venga, and it's kind of like saying, you know, there's also another saying, <laughs> But the first one is that there's no good from which, there's no evil from which good can't come from. And the second saying is, you know, no puedes caer más allá del piso, which is you can't fall further than, than the ground. But the trick is, where is that ground, right? Because every day they seem to define it even lower and lower. So our optimism actually is in, in finding that alternative vision, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but I just wanted to give a quick nutshell of what our work is in the border communities. So thank you, thank you all for for those those insights and and and, and both the, you know, this is really where we're at and this is how low the floor is and how much I may be sinking as well as some of the the notes of optimism and the openings that are there um, as well. Uh, so I want to turn to each of you to to pose a question and I'm going to ask um, with love in my heart. Um, for you to try to keep your responses to <laughs> two, three minutes, because we really are committed to having um, a conversation about a number of topics and also leaving ample time for Q&A, um, and we just can't do that um, otherwise. So I want to actually start um, with, 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 with you, Vicki, um, that we have seen, at least I have seen, um, a lot of, of openness and welcome in the resistance around immigration and the work being done around immigration to LGBTQ folks and movements. I think about the Undocu queer movement and a, and a bunch of others. And I'm wondering, have you been seeing that the other way around? How from, if you, if you put on you know, kind of more the, 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 uh, the immigrants' rights hat, are you seeing participation and activism by LGBTQ movement and organizations? So that's a really interesting question because I do think that there was a time when, when you worked in the immigrant rights. And so just as a backgrounder, I actually started my activism in the LGBTQ rights movement. I worked on the Prop 102 and 107 in Arizona, plus along getting domestic partner benefits with university or state employees in Arizona. But I think that one of the most interesting things that I felt when I wa started working in immigrant rights was a lot of them were groups of faith that I wasn't sure was open, were open to uh, the LGBT community, but I found, much to my um, surprise, welcoming surprise, that uh, they were very welcoming to the LGBT community and they picked up that banner very readily. So I've worked very closely with United We Dream, Undocu Queer, uh, Undocu Black, and they're all opening and creating space for the LGBT community. Where I've seen the LGBT community respond to the immigrant rights movement has been in the community response to a lot of the asylum seekers in the border region. So as many of you may or may not know, they release a lot of the asylum seekers, ICE and Border Patrol, into the communities in Tucson and El Paso all along the border. And a lot of groups have just come forward and created this very welcoming space for them to make, help them get home. And a lot of the people who participate in that are at the LGBT community. But what I don't see is a real energy by the part of um, some of the core LGBTQ groups in actually supporting immigrant rights in the same way that I see vice versa. And I don't understand why that is. And I'd be curious to hear other people what they think about why that is. I don't know if it's, if it's a question of, um, you know, uh, 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 what's that? Um, sorry, I'm forgetting the word. Uh, uh, the unconscious bias towards people of color or what's going on, but I would certainly encourage more of that in the immigrant rights community. Right. Thank you. 
Can I add to that? You can cut time from my, my question. <laughs> Is that okay? I'm already Very cutting nice, time from the, from the opening, <laughs> but go ahead. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that, and I, and I did just want to add a, a slightly different perspective. Um, so for the Transgender Law Center, you know, we've been moving work specifically around trans immigrants and trans migrants for probably five to six years at this point. And I will say it was really has been a push to... to for both the larger immigrant rights movement and the larger LGBT movement to raise up the conditions that trans immigrants in particular are facing and that we had made some progress, I would say, over the last five to six years in having particularly the conditions trans migrants face being much more visible. I will say that in this moment of attack, what I feel like we're seeing is a little bit of a, a, a retraction of that. You know, I feel like we are we are continuing to struggle to raise up the conditions that trans migrants are facing within the broader immigrant rights movement and within the broader LGBT movement. And that there's been incredible organizing that's been led specifically by trans migrants, specifically by black LGBT migrants that has arisen over the last couple of years in the face of these attacks that has, I mean, this organizing has always been happening, but in much more visible ways. So, I mean, I just also want to speak into the room on this topic of um, the conditions of migrants. Um, Roxana Hernandez, mm -hmm. who was a trans woman who died in ICE detention over a year ago. Joanna Medina, who died this year while in ICE custody, and Nabani Nueka, who is a Cameroonian migrant, who died also this year in ICE detention, right? So these are the types of conditions and realities that our communities are facing. And I would say that by, by the broader movements, it continues to be a struggle to raise up and center those issues and the leadership of some of the communities most impacted. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to move right over to you, Chris, so we don't lose track of our time allocations. Um, <laughs> I'll keep it super uh, short. <laughs> and, and I'm going to ask you a ridiculously unfair question in just you know, the, uh, a brief time. Uh, but the nature of this is to ask ridiculous questions because they're all big questions. There, we all know something about the attacks, and you spoke about them, that are happening at the federal level and what's having to be done there. There are also things that are happening at state levels um, as well, and I think we'll talk a little bit about this with Casey um, in a bit as, as well. Can you give folks a sense of the state of play, so to speak, at the state level and what kinds of things you are seeing um, that are coming up as either positive developments or threats? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will answer that question, but I am going to start by, I, I do just want to, and I know Casey spoke to this, but I do really want to raise up the importance of the cases that are before the Supreme Court, right, that are really about, and I'm going to speak specifically to the trans case, which is really about are trans people protected from discrimination in employment, right? But really it's about are trans people, like are we part of this society? Right, and it's ultimately about uh, overall attack on beyond trans folks, right? It's really about gender. It's really about all of our relation to gender and gender expression. So I just really want to like raise up the importance of those cases. Like I was there at, outside the Supreme Court as the case was being heard, and you know there was a rally press conference. It was super powerful, and I did have this moment where I just took this second to say, oh. I realize the Supreme Court of the United States is basically deciding whether or not I am a person in this society, right? That, that is the, the, the tight level of attack that we are talking about. It's really about all of our humanity. So to the state level attacks, I mean, we're gonna see like more anti-trans legislation. We are gonna see more religious refusal bills for sure. We're starting to see these newer attacks that are about um, transition, trans healthcare for young people. Folks may have seen some of this that was happening in South Carolina. Like those are some of the things we're gonna see at the state level, which a lot of it we have already been seeing. The other thing that I will say at the state level is that 
the, both the types of legislative attacks that we will continue to see and the federal attacks mean that at the state and local level that folks are experiencing a ongoing increase in violence and hostility and discrimination just across the board right regardless of if legislation passes regardless of if things move or don't move at the federal level the overall climate of hate means that people in community are experiencing an increased level of violence fear and harassment and that that's part of what we need to hold when we're thinking about this overall context of both federal and state thank you um, and while we're talking about states, um, I wanted to turn to you, Casey, and you alluded to what, what happened in Massachusetts, and I know you had a significant role in that. Congratulations, that was an epic victory. Um, and thinking about the states, some of the states always seem a little more movable on things, and some are already, you know, they're solid blue, and things are, on at least a legal basis, are relatively strong. And then there's states where it looks like it's a really, really long way to go. And to get there, we would have to win over some folks who are not, say, our most natural allies. How is it that you and the Freedom for All Americans and others look for the kind of allies that we would need to bring over if we're going to move the proverbial needle in some of those redder states? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's this is a tough environment, right? So. Um, particularly in the non-discrimination space, but obviously this impacts everything uh, that, we, that we're working on in the states and at the federal level. Here's the landscape that we're operating in. So there are 30 states in this country where there, there is no statute, there is no express protection from discrimination for LGBTQ people in employment, housing, public places, et cetera. 30 of the 50 states. In those 30 states, they are either partially or completely controlled by conservatives. That is the state of play at the state level. There are, you know, there are these Supreme Court cases that are, um, for the LGBTQ community, the most important cases that we've seen reach the court since the marriage equality cases in 2015. And that court is now clearly controlled by conservatives. And then we have a piece of federal legislation that has finally passed the US House. It's a comprehensive bill. It's the most comprehensive piece of legislation we've ever passed at the federal level. It passed on a bipartisan basis in the House. But it is stuck in the Senate because the Senate is controlled by pretty right wing conservatives. And of course, we have a conservative president. So, you know, we have parallel tracks that we need to pursue as a community. You know, there was a time not that long ago when our challenge with Democrats was as difficult as our current challenge with conservatives. Um, and we sort of have to pursue parallel tracks right now where, of course, we want to work hard to ensure that our natural allies are in power, but we also can't give up on the work of building a larger circle of natural allies, right? Like, I think we can't let conservatives off the hook. Um, and I think we also have to give them a chance. I've been on the ground in many of these fights, and when people get to know us personally, they do move, conservative or not. So, you know, here's a couple of, of things to think about, the good news in this area, right? So if the question is, can we move conservatives, the answer is we already know that we can because we already are. And here are some examples. So um, in New Hampshire in 2018, at the time it was Republican controlled in the state legislature at a Republican governor. We moved, they already had sexual orientation protections on the books. We passed a comprehensive transgender non-discrimination law and it was signed by the governor. First time our community has ever passed a non-discrimination law in a Republican controlled state. So we know we can do it. And I know it's New Hampshire and I know we think that it's the Northeast, but New Hampshire's pretty out there if you've been there, right? I mean, these are like, these are like libertarian conservatives. They're tough to wrangle. Um, you know, we, we, I mentioned before, but we won at the ballot in Massachusetts, again, on specifically just the question of whether or not transgender people should be able to access public spaces. This is the whole bathroom fight. We won that with 68% of the vote. The same time, six months before that, in April in Anchorage, Alaska, we won a very similar defensive ballot measure around transgender people. Anchorage is a much more conservative environment than Massachusetts, and we won there too, and we won there before we won in Massachusetts. Um, we have won defensive fights around bathroom bills and transgender people participating in sports, and, and I just wanna say, like, I know we're talking a lot about transgender people, 
But make no mistake, this is about LGBTQ people. It's not about transgender people. The only reason they're coming after us is because we've done less education with Americans about who we are, and so we're more vulnerable. But everything that they're talking about, bathroom bills, whether or not we should be able to participate in sports, it's all message tested. It's all designed to take that 80%, 70-80% support that we have and erode it down to below 50%. And we know from our own testing that it's effective. It's designed to drive a wedge between transgender people, LGBTQ people, and women to drive a wedge between LGBTQ people and people of faith. So like I'm talking a lot about transgender people, but it's not about transgender people. It is about us. They are after us, all of us. Um, So these defensive bills that we've been able to defeat, we've seen hundreds of these anti-transgender attacks in particular, plus the religious exemptions bills that Chris was mentioning. Texas, South, you know, North Carolina, South Dakota, Indiana, Tennessee, you've seen these all in the news. Um, We have beat those bills because we've been able to convince conservatives to kill them. We meet with conservatives, they meet actual living, breathing transgender people and they change their minds. So we can move them even in these contexts. People who have been the champions of those bills in those contexts have been unseated in the last cycle. We continue to see that. We're seeing lots of LGBTQ people elected to office. Um, and on Friday, and this, this has come out publicly in the news and it will trickle out more in, in the next couple of days, on Friday, um, at the federal level, we will see a coalition of uh, conservative, political, and religious groups introduce a piece of federal legislation to try to protect LGBTQ people from discrimination. Um, I haven't read the bill. I don't know if it's a good bill. But what I do know is that is a really big historic deal for our community to have you know, uh, you know, uh, conservative evangelicals and conservative politicians come forward, not only admit that we face discrimination, which they've not admitted before, right? Um, acknowledge that we need protections, which they've never acknowledged before, but actually get in the fight and introduce their own piece of legislation to try to get that done. So we are, we are making gains here. Um, and while we continue the work of trying to put more natural allies in office, we're doing the work of building more um, natural allies. And I'll say one more thing, and then I know my time is up. We need need to wrap up. Um, And I I will just wrap by saying that the way it's happening is not rocket science. It's the same thing that we've been doing all of our time on this earth as LGBTQ people, right? It's telling our stories. It's building a big tent of support, whether it's businesses, conservatives, unions, whoever it is. You know, I, I, I flew into the San Francisco airport today, and you know, there's a big Harvey Milk display, and there's a sign, and uh, there's a sign of him carrying something that says like "Straits for you know gay rights." That's we're doing the same thing. It's still the same coalition building that we've always been doing. So um, you know, the answer to the question is not only can we build this support, but we are building this support. And even though this climate is very difficult and it's hard to work in a bipartisan manner in the environment that we're working on, I think it's not only how we'll advance these issues, but I actually think it's part of the way we're going to heal the country as well. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to step back and 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 talk about things on um, on a, a global stage. I, it, and it ties in a little bit to the, what we were just talking about with, with, with Casey, that, but on an international level, that you know, we see, as you described so well, steps forward, steps back, some really horrifying things that are happening in some places and exciting things in, in, in others. And a lot of those, I assume that outright and you know, folks who are fighting for our rights on an international stage have to find, among other things, unlikely allies. And I was wondering if you could talk about how that plays on an international level, and if there's maybe an instance or two that come to mind about where we've either been successful or where we've been foiled. Absolutely. You have the unenviable job of trying to get a bunch of queer people to be brief, <laughs> Roger. Well, but people with, 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 and with ridiculously broad and impossible questions, so, so we, we will adjust, but I thank you for your continuing attention to that. <laughs> No problem. So yeah, we you know we are working, of course, with the natural allies, folks that are traditional human rights organizations that are not just focused on LGBTIQ human rights, women's rights organizations, sexual health and reproductive health organizations, um, friendly governments, and grassroots activists all over the world, where we find, and and some of and I should say that some of the activists that we work with really have have helped lead the way in terms of finding new allies to work with. For example, a lot of the activists that we work with in island nations, specifically in the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands, do they think of themselves as climate justice activists and LGBTIQ activists. That's totally, they cannot separate those parts of their identity. And I definitely think that that's one area that we can learn from them and do better. Where we've found um, kind of at at a global level some unexpected allies have been 
people of faith, faith communities, um, faith institutions, and lay, lay people of faith. And I think that this is, this is an area that we, we haven't done as great a job as we could, and we need to do a better job. Um, if we want to make the kind of, do the familiarity work that you were talking about, Casey, and the, talking about, it's about our humanity work that you were talking about, Chris, I think we need to really embrace that. And even though we know that religious institutions are often the ones who have ostracized us and are perpetrating and exporting transphobia and homophobia all over the world, so I'm not saying that we, we, we have to stand up and oppose that, but we need people of faith and leaders of faith to help us do that. The other place is the business sector. And again, this is, you know, you have to tread a little bit carefully here, but I think we have seen some of our business partners start to speak out and speak up in new ways beyond kind of the traditional corporate partnerships around visibility and events, trying to actually get more, they'll call us and ask for advice on how they can how they can be a part of advocacy efforts that are on the ground um, around the world. There's a new coalition, uh, the Partnership for Global LGBTIQ Equality, that Outright is a part of with a number of multinational corporations that are not just thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but starting to think about how they can use their collective muscle for actual advocacy efforts to try to change, in some cases, laws on the ground. A couple of examples of just not unexpected allies, but unexpected progress. I already talked about the decriminalization that's happened over the past year. I don't think that, I think that the, it, the case that happened in India last fall where the Supreme Court unanimously struck down their homo anti-homosexuality law was, was definitely a bit of surprise at how wide, far reaching and unanimous that was. Angola, Botswana, and Bhutan have also decriminalized homosexuality over the past year. Um, Singapore, which still criminalizes same-sex relations, in just in October amended their Religious Harmony Act to include LG, to include uh, sexual orientation as part of the protected class around religiously motivated motivated um, hate speech. And in the Caribbean, even though most of the, the majority of the countries there still have buggery sodomy laws on the books, we actually see an incredibly thriving LGBTIQ community, and particularly the trans community. A number of emerging trans organizations have, have become legally registered in the Caribbean. Um, there are uh, several countries that are pursuing decriminalization cases right now. Pride marches in countries that have not had pride marches before. So um, the last example that I'll give is a personal one. Um, it's a story of an activist partner um, of Outrights who is a very long time trans leader in the uh, Southern Africa um, from Zimbabwe, Ricky Nathanson, who, who some of you have met before. She's also one of our board members. And she was, after you know many, many years of work, she was arrested for using a ladies' restroom in Zimbabwe. She was arrested, she was harassed, abused. She filed a lawsuit against the government of Zimbabwe and she just found out about two weeks ago that she won her case. And it's a completely historic and landmark case for transgender rights in Zimbabwe. So these are places that you don't necessarily expect to see progress, but it, it, it is happening. It is moving forward and with you know the sustained efforts of, of all of us and, and all of you, we can keep that momentum moving forward. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, so we're, we're we're pushed a little bit on the time front, um, and as I said, I'm committed to making sure that we have plenty of time for, for questions and answers. And so I have two questions that I want to pose to 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 all of you, and there won't be time for everyone to answer. And I'm going to ask people, and again, I know this is ridiculous given the questions I'm going to ask, but to 60 seconds, because because otherwise we're just not going to give folks who come here chances to ask questions, and we're really committed to that. So the first question is. We all know that we're headed into the presidential, uh, presidential election. Um, and we know uh, lots about some of the challenges, you know, all of the dust that's going to be kicked up around this, it's going to be ugly, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any places where you might see particular opportunities for our communities and for allied movements that we care about? And I'd like to start with you, Vicki, if I could. Yeah, sure. So actually, uh, we have been engaging with a number of the of the, the candidates. Um, and, and, and I'm really excited to talk about this because uh, you know this year we developed this new board of vision and I left some copies in the back. But 
uh, that basically talks about a different way of looking at border and trying to shift away from that narrative of border security to talking about border governance that includes you know, public safety for all, that includes uh, a welcoming system at the borders, and it includes um, and, you know, the, the, the protection of human rights at the border. Now this is based on human rights, international, uh, international human rights law, and we have no doubt that this kind of border governance model can actually be implemented here, and we've been talking to a number of candidates about trying to change, shift that vision away from border security to this, to a border governance model that makes more sense and is, is more in line with our, our values. Uh, but the most interesting thing, too, is that we actually, a colleague of ours at the, at the U.S. Immigration Policy Center at the University of California in San Diego, actually did some polling of the voters in California and Arizona and in Texas and New Mexico. And even in Arizona and even in Texas, the majority of the voters oppose things like border wall funding, and they actually support a more humanitarian, humane approach to receiving asylum seekers at our border, even in Texas. I want to say that, because a lot of people <laughs> think that Texas isn't that way. So I think that that's kind of where we're focusing our energies on Great. around the elections. So, and I also have copies of this in the back. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one other person to offer something around that, if, 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 if you do. I can do it really quick, I promise, Roger. Um, <laughs> two, two really quick points, really, really, really quick. I'm just um, doing my job. There are, you know, you're doing a great job. There, uh, I'm particularly hard. Um, so there, there are narrative opportunities. So there's, there's obviously a very big federal election, um, but there are elections in 48 of the states as well. And so there are narrative opportunities in all of these elections where there's an opportunity to inject our issues and the issues we care about into the race um, in really sort of tactical and strategic ways that I won't get into, but I, I will just say generally Generally speaking, the elections are an opportunity to try to get candidates, um, or at least the media, talking about either what candidates have said about us or what they haven't said about us. Either way, we can really leverage that. Um, the second point is there are also organizing opportunities in all of these states to engage in these races, even in C3 ways that aren't that aren't electoral specific, where we can um, organize in these races and build assets so that come 2021, when states ripen into climates where we really can move things um, in a proactive way. We've built the assets that we need in order to be able to move them. And that is particularly important in a lot of the states where we need to move a lot of these issues because, you know, it, it's not just that the climates are conservative-led and they're difficult, but a lot of these states, when you think about the South and the Midwest, I mean, it's just a true thing for our community that a lot of them just have not gotten the same kind of resources that some of the coastal states get. And so the education, the asset building, all of those things just have not been done. And so leveraging that as an opportunity to build those assets is definitely something we're looking at. Great, great. Thank you. Um, I, I actually want to just uh, go go to the next next question, but I'm going to give you the first shot at it. How about that? <laughs> okay. 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 All right. All right. So um, same rules, um, and perhaps an even more ridiculous question, but I think one that is extremely important, um, and, and that is that um, racial equity is is our you know, is a pair of words that uh, you know everybody in this room has heard, and you know certainly been been talked about a great deal in the LGBTQ movement and in other progressive movements, uh, and. From your perspective, to what extent do you see the LGBTQ movement moving to take on a real framework around racial equity rather than a framework that says just counts noses, you know, in a more of a diversity kind of a framework? Um, where do you see us at this point in time? Well, I'm going to segue by saying that I think that uh, there's a huge opportunity, especially on a day when we lost a black woman candidate for president. Mm to elect openly LGBTIQ people, women, people of color in this next election and to win state legislatures. So that's my segue into talking, and it doesn't it work to talk? It segues into it. racial equity perfectly. So, um, you know, our, our view, our, the way that we kind of approach uh, racial equity on a global level, oftentimes discussion is 
built into the larger framework around decolonization, decolonization in general and decolonization of, of our movement. Because the truth is that many of the sodomy, buggery, and criminalization laws that our communities are facing around the world were imposed by clo the colonial European powers. And now we have uh, religious zealots who are exporting um, oftentimes from the global north and west religiously motivated homophobia and transphobia to other parts of the world. So, you know, this is, this is a conversation on how we de decolonize our movement, which has been seen as mostly Western and white. And when we apply a racial justice lens to the global movement, we can see that the global, global North and Global West organizations, which are majority white organizations in more, more uh, majority white countries, receive the overwhelming, overwhelming amount of resources for LGBTIQ rights, in spite of the equally, if not greater, need in Global South and East countries, which are often communities of color. So there's a great need for funders, governments, and organizations, frankly, like Outright, and other organizations in the Global North and the Global West to support, prioritize solidarity with Global South and East movements and activists, which means more funding for those groups and activists, st stepping back and ceding power to them, and letting them set their own agenda and priorities. For us, that looks like hiring people of color from countries and regions where we're trying to do programs for established leaders from the community and using the platform that we have in places like the UN not to present our own agenda but to kick the door open for activists so that they can share their own experiences and demands. I see this starting to happen amongst the funders of this, of this movement um, and, and the conversation certainly is happening amongst activists within the movement, but it needs to be accelerated and amplified, not just here, but all over the world. All right, th thank you. Um, Chris? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, I have a couple ways to answer this, and I'll try to do it in 60 seconds. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of the broader LGBT movement, there is absolutely a lot more work that needs to be done. And I can give a very concrete example. So this uh, year was the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. There were celebrations all across the country. And what TLC and Familia Trans Liberation Movement and the Black LGBTQI might QIA Migrant Project, um, which is a new organization. It's national. Totally look them up. They're doing incredible work, one of the first of its kind. The message that we put out is Stonewall is now. Raising up that in this moment, and has been true for decades, black and brown trans women are still being murdered, are still facing police violence, that trans migrants are facing horrible violence, discrimination, and harassment, and being murdered in ICE detention. So while there was celebration, our message as black and brown communities was Stonewall is now, right? So I think that's just a really concrete example of the work that our movement still has to do. Um, that said, there are incredible trans, um, LGBT, uh, people of color led organizations all across the country that have existed forever um, and I would say are, are stronger than ever before and leading incredibly powerful work. And I think that if our kind of broader movements can really center in and raise up the leadership of some of the communities who are most vulnerable in this, particularly in this moment of escalated attacks, that if we're talking about racial equity and moving the dial in our movement on racial equity, that that will uh, go an incredibly long way. And that what is at stake, particularly in this moment, is literally like we are losing people and we will continue to lose people and what is at stake is how much we're able to, to lessen that. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I now want to, as promised, um, um, open it up and we're, and we're going to um, have the allocated time that, that I had mentioned and then um, we're gonna have just very, very brief closings um, here, so we'll shave some time from that. So what I'd like to do is to take, you know, two or three questions, um, you know, as, as a batch, and then give a chance for a, a couple folks to uh, uh, speak to them, uh, and then move to another batch. So um, questions, please. Um, there's a roving microphone right there, I believe. Um, so, I'm sorry? Two mics. Oh, two mics, two mics, not just two mics. I see one, one hand there, one hand down here. 
Yes, please. I'll ask a quick one. Um, you won't ask for money, so I'll ask for money for you, which is to encourage people to donate to your organizations. But I'd also like to ask you to give us a recommendation for an organization that we might not know about that would benefit from the support of us at a small or larger dollar level. So where would you direct our money besides to you guys? Yeah. Great, thank you very much for that question. I know we're all eager to talk about that one. Um, but, 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 but I saw another question down here, please. Hi, actually it wasn't a question, it was a statement that you know, while you folks talk about global and national um, and state things, I think if we hit the county level and the local level, we are having now the census 2020. It's in terribly important mm -hmm. that the LGBT community to partake, partake of that. Alameda County had a uh, s survey for um, um, elder citizens Nobody talked about elder citizens, but elder citizens, and they had something for LGBT families. We need more of that, and I think as the momentum builds in 2020, uh, we have an opportunity because uh, we need to say something. We need to, we need to get that census 2020 done so that LGBT people are included in it. Uh, the, the other thing was that I, for, for terms of hope, um, for the first time, I've ever seen in the East Bay and Alameda County, the various cities and county buildings had LGBT <coughs> pride rainbow flags flying from the, from the city halls. This was, a, this was a watershed time. I have never seen that before. We need to be proud of that. We need to push for it at that level as you go on to your other, other things. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I see a hand in the back as well, please. And then we'll turn to our, our panelists. It's just a quick comment. I, I really am uh, appreciative of people who said that surprising allies are people of faith. And I say that as a person of faith and also as an out gay clergy person in the United Methodist Church. Um, but I feel that the way it was presented is that uh, people of faith and churches and uh, religious groups are not part of the queer community, when in fact there are queer LGBTQ people of faith. And in my denomination, we just elected an out lesbian bishop a few years back. So we're part of this community. It's also that we are people of faith. And so I hope that organizations that work around the border, um, I'm also an immigrant and a political asylee, so I have that intersection embodied. Um, there are people of faith who are LGBTQ that you can work with. So when we tell our stories, you know, we would want to be able to help you, our own community. So we're also struggling within our own religious communities for our own freedom within. Like Martin Luther King said that our, our freedom uh, as oppressed is also tied to the freedom of our oppressor. And so we're working from within and at the same time wanting to partner with our queer siblings who are working generally. So there's always that misnomer that, oh, like myself, I live in a queer people of color collective in San Francisco. That's the only way to live here. And they're not religious. And they keep asking me, are you trying to convert gay people to church? I said, no, we're already in church. And so thank you so much for that input, insight from you. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, um, if there are things that, that folks want to mention regarding the question about counties or uh, the, the faith question, but also I want to zero back in on the original question that Alex asked about, uh, is there an, an organization that, in addition to each of your organizations, that you think people may not know about that? Um, and you, I know you mentioned several earlier on, Chris, um, but maybe Vicki, starting with, with, with you. Yeah, sure. So we actually uh, have been getting a lot of requests. So that prompted us to create a website on our website that lists all of the organizations that actually welcome. They're you know, they're they're implementing welcoming centers all along the border, and all of these people are volunteers, and and could welcome any kind of donation. And I'm thinking of like Casalitas in Tucson, which there's also uh, Casa Mariposa, which is a transgender hospitality um, 
for, for asylum seekers who are of, of the trans community. They provide hospitality rooms for them and help them accompaniment provide accompaniment to them. There's all these organizations along the border that do this, and, I, and that's a story that doesn't get out there, right? All these hundreds of people that volunteer their time and energy to help, help individuals who once released by Border Patrol and ICE and help them find their way home. <coughs> Great, thanks. Just going down the line. Casey. Yeah, I mean, just just quickly, I'll just say, um, you know, I think Chris already hit on this point, but um, in general, I think trans organizations across the country are are tremendously under resourced, and I would say, in this moment, what's on my mind as a trans person, um, as some of the most um, kind of frontline and important work is the direct services work. Right, we're all talking about policy, and policy organizations are flashy and blingy, and resources come to us. It's not magic, but they come to us. Um, but there are uh, just a number of organizations that are really working on the front lines around just really ensuring that transgender people can, you know, um, access name change documents and, you know, social security name changes, um, ensuring that, uh, you know, transgender people can receive training on, um, you know, vocational training in order to be able to get jobs. These are actually really, like, life and death issues for our community. Um, it, you know, if you're not a transgender person, the, the significance of changing your, your gender identity documents um, probably is not accessible. I know this as someone who was not a transgender person for a, a long time in my life. Um, but it is truly transformative. And as someone who does this work for a living, when I moved from Massachusetts to California, I cannot tell you how much hassle they gave me. I had a license with the correct name and the correct pronoun from Massachusetts. I cannot tell you what I went through in California to be able to get it changed into a California license. And I know what I'm doing. So I was like, I don't understand how people who don't do this for a living know how to do this. So the organizations that come to mind for me around those kinds of issues are um, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, which is based out of New York. And I've been following um, trans, trans can work, which I believe is based out of Los Angeles, right? Which is really sort of the nitty gritty, like working with transgender people um, to help them get jobs, to get the training that they need to get jobs, get their resumes together, get out there, um, interview and get jobs. Just really basic services that transgender people really need to survive. Um, yeah, so there is an organization called the Trans Justice Funding Project. Um, I would really recommend that folks go to their website and check it out because basically Gabriel Foster, who's their executive director, um, and some other folks with that organization, they have mapped out the trans organizations all across the country. So we're talking about like super small orgs who have like no budgets, no staff, to groups that are maybe a little bigger. Like they literally have mapped it out. Cross issues like service groups, advocacy groups, like just go to their site um, and there's tons of groups that could use support. Um, and then also just to raise up some border groups as well. So there's also uh, Casa Arcoiris, which is one of the LGBT shelters um, that's uh, housed LGBT folks at the border. And then there's a group called the Haitian Bridge Alliance um, that's specifically been providing support to black migrants at the border, including LGBT folks. Um, and both of those organizations are able to receive US donations. Um, and it, the money goes a very, very long way um, at the border. Katie? Thank you for that question, especially on Giving Tuesday. <laughs> I don't know if anyone heard about that. Just kidding. Um, when I, I would just invite you, if there's any particular country that you might be interested or region of the world, to come talk to me because we have you know, thousands of activists that we work with in every country in the world that we can recommend. Um, the one that I just want to lift up is Transwave Jamaica, which is the first trans organization um, in Jamaica and um, is an incredible organization doing work not only in Jamaica, but really a, a leading organization in the Caribbean. Um, and I just wanted to do a shout out quickly, say thank you for reframing the commentary around religion and people of faith. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, we, one thing that I was going to mention is that Outright has a UN Religion Fellows Program. And part of the, 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 the idea behind that is really to counter the religiously motivated transphobia and homophobia that we see happening around the world. Um, one of the benefits of that program is bringing in people from around the world who identify as LGBTIQ and people of faith whether they're, they identify as Muslim or Christian, to walk into the UN system and to say, I am a Christian from Jamaica and a LGBTIQ person, and those things are not contradictory. They are all part of my identity. And so I really appreciate you reframing that and, and lifting that up again. Other questions? Yes, please, I see you down here and then 
on there, and then and one more there. Actually, I'm going to take all four of those, and I'm going to ask you please to try to keep them really concise um, because we, we, we are running short on time. So please go ahead. It's actually two, but I'll make them quick. Thank you. One, uh, all of you, which candidate do you think might be most supportive? <laughs> and two, um, I'm sure some of you have heard something about it. It's, it's been bothering me for weeks now. There's a separation going on, at least in the public social media, of trans communities and trans victims of violence and trans uh, youth leaders, et cetera, separating from the LGBTQ movement. And I just saw on Twitter today, somebody I've been following said, I forget who, said, there is no LGB without the TIQ. And, and so it's an argument that's going on with some separation amongst the activists and the youth okay. that uh, we're only lifting up the trans and we only should lift up the trans because they've been left behind or, or only trans people of color or some kind of little competition there for limited funds and limited power. Okay. If you could thank address you. that. Thank, th thank you. Um, so uh, actually, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut it off. So there, there, and then there, but only if you promise to be really quick. And uh, I apologize <laughs> again. Yes, go ahead. I've never heard of three of your organizations before tonight. I want to know, what are we going to do to try to get the word out about the great resources we have around the country? I I'm created a resource here for the city. We have another one in Los Angeles. But what are we going to do to get the word out about all the great transgender organizations, all the great resources we have for refugees and so forth? Is, is there something, is somebody trying to create that sort of resource? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, oh, I, I, I think in the in the white there. I think you had a question. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And then and then there's a woman okay. in the white. Okay. I'll be really quick. Thank you. Um, it's for the the woman to your that side. Katie. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you are making alliances with uh, the business uh, part of the world, and my question for you is, what if anything? are these businesses asking for in return, which businesses are apt to do? <laughs> okay. and, la and lastly, please. Thank you. Um, there's been an, a, a tension in the past between advocacy organizations and grassroots movements. And in the last, um, in this administration, we've seen a huge increase in grassroots activism around elections, the women's marches, um, all kinds of electoral activity, and I'm wondering what's the state of the gay and lesbian, LGBTQI, but grassroots movements, where can we see us coalescing and coming together? Because we did it around uh, marriage and mm -hmm. even, God help us, don't ask, don't tell, yeah. but uh, now some of the perceived stuff like climate and the um, government complete bankruptcy morally um, is, are not ad so clearly identified as our issues. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take each of these and, and ask one person to, to, to volunteer to respond to it. Okay, um, so the first question um, with respect to, and pardon me if I don't, if I don't get this right, but around uh, some folks uh, advocating possibly for transgender folks or some part of the community to, uh, to, to separate, I think was the word, word, word that you use. And so um, does anybody care of any, I, I, if, 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 uh, if, if, if. I'll, I'll just say quick, I mean, I'm not aware of that. I mean, I'm not aware of specifically what you're seeing, although I think there's, all, there's always this ongoing conversation in our community about how it all fits together. Right. Um, so I can't, I can't speak to what that's about, but I will say this, which is that is, our, that is an opposition tactic. And we do know that our opposition is working actively to divide our community right now. They are trying to gin up trans versus LGBTQ discussion. They're using um, women, 
um, knowingly and unknowingly uh, for some of the women who are speaking out in this way to sort of divide and fracture the community. And I think there is m much like a lot of what we need to be doing in this moment where it is the divide and conquer is the central tactic of this federal administration. We just can't fall for it. We just can't fall for it. Like we just, there is just no way we can survive in this moment if we let them fracture us like that. Yeah. Um, the question about, about is there a, a way of getting the word out and all that, I will just say that to my knowledge, there is no such thing, at least you know, on, a, on a national basis, and unless anybody, which is unfortunate, but it's, but it's uh, it, the case, unless anybody has anything additional to, I don't know about to respond to that, I just want to move on to the next, not to ignore it, but just I think the answer is unfortunately there's not. I will just say that in addition to contacting outright if you're interested in a particular country, the best resource that I know of for finding who's doing what around the world is an organization called ILGA, I-L-G-A, and it's basically a membership association for like every, you know, or any kind of remotely established LGBTIQ organization in the world. That's, the, that's where I often go. And a question about what are businesses asking for in, in, in return? Um, I think that was actually posed to you, to you, Katie, so I'm going to turn that one to you. Yes. You mean it's not all just altruistic? <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the visibility piece certainly hasn't changed, and we, we have to look at, I mean, we, Roger knows we as a board and as an organization have very clear values about, you know, who we are willing to partner with and who, who we are not willing to partner with, um, because we don't want to be just an excuse for a company to pink wash their treatment of our community or frankly on any you know other communities that are part of our community and important to us um, but recently we've been seeing also requests for other things like um, you know for example training um, we've have a lot of companies that have asked us to come and do internal trainings presentations to their employee resource groups or trainings to within their diversity equity and inclusion departments and efforts um, also I think I mentioned this just in passing but there are a number of companies that have approached us asking for advice like uh, for example um, when, so, for example, if a boycott is called for um, in Brunei or Jamaica, or you know, from time to time you see calls for boycotts, we, we have a lot of companies that want, they don't know how to respond. They don't know who to call. They don't know what's happening on the ground. They really, they really want to understand so that they, they can do the right thing. So there's, it's not just visibility. I think that's a big part of it, but there's also some new, new things that we've, we've heard. Great, thank you, thank you. So I, I, I want to just make sure that we, that we have somebody to be able to offer something with respect to the question that came up around the uh, around the grassroots, kind of like what's going on with, with the grassroots. And we have heard a number of things, a lot of things, Vicki, that, that, that you shared and, and, and Chris and others, um, but I don't know if somebody wants to volunteer to just offer a, Vicki, I Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I think this speaks a lot to what Casey was saying earlier on about, you know, not allowing, so, in, in order for grassroots to truly be effective under this administration, it really is about showing up. And it's showing up not just for the issue that you care the most about, but it's about showing up for all the issues that, because that's, that's exactly what the tactic is. Divide, attack people to fragment <coughs> them. Mm. But if we were to stand up and show up when any one of our brothers and sisters are being attacked, then that creates a stronger front, it creates unity. So I would encourage that, to have more grassroots, more unity, to show up on all causes uh, to the best of your ability. I know there are a lot, but I think whenever you can, and that is really crucial, particularly in this moment in time. I do actually think that we're headed for a crazy dictatorship kind of like the one I grew up in in Latin America, right? The ones that we witnessed before we came to this country, it's all of a sudden like the United States is becoming one, right? And, and, and I think it's time that we need to say, this can't happen here, this doesn't fit our values, even though we know that historically we have done terrible things to different groups. That's not what our aspirational values are. So we need to stand in unity. And then lastly, I do want to say something about the corporate stuff. I do believe that there's a crisis, uh, that we've lost our moral compass in this country. And I, and I hate to sound like a socialist, but honestly, 
it's because of our economic business model that we have in this country, where we can only create jobs through a law enforcement only model, where we're, all we're doing is imprisoning people of color, where we're arresting people of color. That has become a business model for this country, building a border wall. Think of all the corporations that are benefiting from that alone. So we need to shift that business model towards something that we really want, like renewable resources. And so when we talk to corporations, my challenge to them is come up with something better, something more creative that, that will create the jobs for the, the, this economy that doesn't fall into the trap of where the only place we can make money is by building these oppressive systems, not just in the border, but throughout this country. So I want to actually pick up to kind of bring, bring, us, bring, us, bring us back home, and we could go on for hours. Um, <laughs> there's more than enough to talk about. Uh, but I want to ask, as you brought up the specter of creeping dictatorship, um, <laughs> that I actually would like to turn that around a little bit and just ask each of you, and I really mean like 60 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna, like, I, I'm gonna touch the table like that, okay? With my apologies. Uh, but what is one thing about our movement that you are hopeful about today that a year ago you would not have been hopeful about? This is really specific. <clears throat> but it's okay. Yeah. Um, I mentioned in my opening that there are only four countries that ban conversion therapy globally. And um, there are 18 states, California being the first, that ban conversion therapy here in the US. Um, you may have heard this week the news that Utah is, is likely to become the 19th state, actually due in part to support from the Mormon church. It's kind of amazing to say that. Um, but, and of course, you know the, the work of our community on the ground organizing primarily. But the point I'm making is I think the issue of conversion therapy is one where I see gives me hope because I see the progress that has made been made in a very short amount of time in this country and I think that there's a huge opportunity to take that campaign to the rest of the world and work with partners on the ground all over the world to try to get conversion therapy banned and also probably even equally or not, if not more importantly, to do the familiarity work that Casey was talking about to, to try to change the conditions that lead to abusive and torturous practices like conversion therapy in the first place. So that's one place I see for hope. Great, thank you. Um, whoever next, Chris. Um, I, I also really wanted to answer the question around policy litigation and like grassroots, so I'm gonna do it with this as well. Um, so I, I just think there are actually really incredible, beautiful, inspiring, and powerful examples of the ways that coalitions of groups are coming together exactly to use litigation, to use policy, to use movement building and grassroots organizing to address an issue. Like one very concrete example, we're part of a migrant justice coalition along with a number of or other organizations, and we're bringing the litigation. Like other groups are bringing the grassroots organizing, other groups are bringing the policy work, other groups are bringing the leadership development, but all together we're organizing this larger national migrant justice campaign. And I feel like I'm actually seeing more and more examples of that in this moment of escalated attack where groups are coming together and saying, like, we just need to move this intervention. We need to do this one thing because literally people's lives are gonna depend on it. So we're all just gonna bring our stuff to the table and figure it out because this is the one goal. This isn't about like lining our pockets or our budgets. This is about actually like moving the dial on an injustice that is about our community survival. Right. Thank you. Casey? Yeah, um, so uh, so this one's a little bit personal and a little bit professional. So, you know, growing up as like a young trans person trying to figure out how I was gonna live the life I was born to lead, um, my sort of wish was just to be left alone, you know, and be safe. Um, I never really imagined that people who weren't having the experience I was having would take up my cause as their own. And as we, as we got close to winning marriage equality, I think a lot of us in the movement were worrying that the movement writ large would think we were done. And there's a lot of work to do for all LGBTQ people, but we knew especially there was going to be a lot of work left to do for trans people, in large part because in a lot of places we'd been asked to wait on that work in order to make this wholesale case for 
for marriage equality. And so we were worried that people would not show up, that the enthusiasm would not be there. And so to have ballot fights of all the fights we could possibly have right after winning marriage equality, I mean, this was like kind of the worst of the worst. And so for me, I'm cheating a little because it didn't just happen. This happened in the last year and gives me hope now. But I think, you know, being on the ground in those ballot fights in Anchorage and Massachusetts and seeing people choose that issue to send their counter narrative to what they're seeing in this country right now and show up in that way, not just the people who've been around um, all these years fighting on marriage equality and other issues, but seeing new people come into the fight, you know, the parents of these young people who are, do not get in their way. Like these are the best allies that we could have as, as, a, as a large LGBTQ community has been really inspiring and, and is really what, um, you know, and a lot of them conservative as well, right? And um, has been really inspiring and is what made me think that, you know, to your point, like, I, you know, we have a lot of work to do, not just to win on these issues, but really to heal our country. And, and this is one of the ways that organizing that we're doing right now and the way we're keeping people together and building um, building bridges and that people are showing up is, is going to advance LGBTQ rights. But I really do think it's going to help um, culturally with our community as well, kind of help bring people back together. Okay, thank you. Last word, Vicki? Sure, so I keep the, you know, some philosopher, one of those Greek ones, came up with, <laughs> uh, came up with this idea that, you know, that we needed evil in the world because with evil we now know what good looks like because, you know, that's a counterpoint. So. I, and I'm seeing a lot of groups around the country on various social justice issues coming together to develop a vision that's different from the one that currently exists. And so that's what gives me hope. And this, the poll that we just recently, uh, well, we didn't do it, but the um, University of, of uh, Southern California did, really, for me, gave me hope. Because it basically said that the, four, the, that the voters, the vast majority of US citizen voters in the southwestern states actually oppose Trump's policies at the border. And I don't know if that doesn't give you hope, I don't know what does, right? <laughs> so that's definitely something that I got very hopeful about. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I want to, to, to try to wrap us up by remembering something that Chris, that, that you said, and that was heard a lot in, around Stonewall 50 uh, and, and after that, and that is that Stonewall is now. That it didn't stop 50 years ago, it didn't stop when we got marriage equality or anything else, that it's very much now. And that was specifically with respect to trans and POC issues, but it's true in many other areas, including ones named here. And going back to what I started with, with the idea of the movement hurtling forward, if we're going to continue to hurdle forward and to move forward, then one of the things that we need absolutely is going to be power and it's going to be leadership. And we have been fortunate and I am very, very grateful that we have these four folks here, not only being with us tonight, but doing all of the work that you are doing day in and day out, day in and day out. Um, for the movement on so many different levels. So thank you all. And the other thing that we need in order to be able to move forward and to be able to, to, to continue to hurdle forward is community. And community is everybody in this room. And that means the people who contribute on every level, grassroots, policy work, advocacy level, by the giving that you do, by the work that you do, by where you show up. And by remembering that, as Chris reminded us, that Stonewall is now. And so I want to thank all of you for everything that you do, for every gift that you give, and for being with us here tonight. Thank you very, very much.